Salut, beautiful people. Welcome to The Glass Prism. Simon, Mohad, and I will embark on a three-part series focusing on the implications and ideas of the disruptive and now popular technology of brain-computer interfaces, with a specific focus on Elon Musk's company, Neuralink. For this episode, we jump right into what Neuralink is and how it could redefine the health industry and the meaning of health as we know it. If you are interested in getting to know the implications of this technology involving social communication and biosecurity, check out the second and third episode of the series as well. This is the Glass Prison Podcast. Enjoy. All right, guys. So what is the topic for today? We're actually going to be talking about the implications of having a neural connection between different brains in our society and how that might affect our way of life. Nice. So today's episode is going to be focused more on the health side of things, wouldn't it? Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, we will have future episodes too to talk about other implications. So stay tuned for that, guys. Yeah, so we did a lot of research about this. There are some very fascinating things we're going to be talking about today. And uh, today is going to be very, very focused on the health implications and how it's going to help out a lot of people and potentially even endanger some. So right now, obviously, the amount of information that we're working on is not much. But from what we can basically surmise from different uh, neuroscientists, Elon Musk and other commentators in the field, we can actually talk about the implications quite confidently about what they're intended to do. Let's, let's start off with this. What's, what is Elon Musk's vision, for example, for, for Neuralink and its devices? Well, I mean, like the goal here is a lot more, what's the word, like achievable in that like he, he at first what he wants to do is use it in a way to like help uh, improve our health. It, but th- then the premise it, uh, comes to the idea that like we will be putting a chip in your head, right? He's mm-hmm. done it before. He's done it in monkeys. He's done it in pigs, mm-hmm. yeah. right? Of course. So it, it, it like we we're slowly getting there. Yeah. Right. But um, it's it's pretty interesting if you look at the work he does. Like I don't know if you guys have uh, looked that much into it yet. Uh, the monkey video. I'm pretty sure everybody has seen that. The monkey video is basically this video of this monkey who's playing pong with his mind. Yeah. Because this monkey was like an ML, MLG pro. He was just going at that pong like. Pew, pew. <laughs> is that the sound that Paul makes? I have no idea. Yeah, it's uh, it's phenomenal because now we know that even if you have technologies that are not part of your body, you can possibly use it as an extension to your body, like mm-hmm. as if it was a motor technique that you can use. So if monkeys can do it, so could we. That's the theory right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Though we have vastly more complex brains and so the implications of having such a device in our heads is very immense because you don't know what's going to act like in a human brain yeah yeah well i mean we move away from just monkeys playing video games like there are more practical applications even closer to the episode of black mirror perhaps we might be able to access memories the way that the monkeys are able to access the ball and pong like uh, these things will seem more and more natural as uh, the technology progresses, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. What do we know now so far about the surgical yeah. procedure, for example, of implementing a Neuralink device? Just to quickly like go over it really quick. Like Again, so what Elon Musk like, envisions right now mm-hmm. is that eventually you come to the hospital, you know, you come for your appointment, you sit under, this study is crazy, you sit under a robot with no anesthesia. Right. Under a robot. Yeah, under yeah. a robot. I'm going to word it that <laughs> way. very interesting. Because I want you to think of it like, like, through that like perspective. But you like to keep your mind out of the gutter, sir. Listen, I wasn't even... <laughs> whatever, bro. <laughs> Better okay. in a gutter than uh, okay, under okay. a robot. Okay. <laughs> Body under a robot. Got it. Okay. Continue. Okay, okay, okay. Anyway, anyway. So the idea here is that you undergo a procedure with a surgical robot. And then from there, what happens is that it least scans your brain. Mm-hmm. No anesthesia. It- Doctor there? No, uh, at the beginning, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm assuming that in the future you'll want to keep him, but for sure at the beginning, they already discussed having a surgeon at hand, a neurosurgeon. Okay. Nice. Right. Yeah. But literally you slide under, they literally cut a hole in your brain like, just to make it like simple, right? Simple, he says, cut a hole in the brain, he says. Yeah, like, literally, <laughs> there's literally a hole in the top of your skull, Yeah. scans okay. your brain real quickly, all the blood vessels and everything, and starts injecting a the gold wires we discussed, mm-hmm. right? And then after it's all done... The surgical robot will again seal your head back up, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. this is supposed to all occur under less than an hour. 
or around an hour, I mean, right? It yeah, it's uh, it's a high precision um, like procedure, isn't it? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, the the surgeon that's on hand will not know where the arteries of the brain go. Yeah, and there there's not some uniformity of here where all the small arterioles are going to go into the brain. Exactly. There, yeah, so it's very hard to do that as a neurosurgeon, but definitely you can use robots for that purpose. So the implementation part is fairly safe. I'm thinking more about the the long term um, implications of having such a device in your head. For example, is Cristiano Ronaldo going to be able to do those headers while that device is in his head? Is it going if it hits on a specific angle? Yikes! If that person ends up hitting their head in a in a specific way or shaking it in a in a way, won't those wires move? Right? Will those wires be as precise as they were intended to be once you implemented them or put them into your brain? The technological aspect of it is definitely something to be considered because everything wears away. Like your iPhone, mm. your computer, everything is going to wear away. So, how many times is this um, interesting operation going to be performed? Like, yeah. that's kind of scary. Like, oh, every year, maybe you upgrade, you need to do something to your actual physical hardware. Like I wouldn't, I would not want to have to go through that, right? Because yeah. even yeah, because yeah, even if they're scanning like your brain and then they're just injecting it, like the brain moves a lot. Yeah, so it's like, like jello, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, so like <laughs> when the wires move along with it, mm-hmm. right? But just to add to what you're saying, Simon, right? He's planning to make it a, a, like at the beginning. Of course, it'll cost a couple million dollars. Like it's gonna be pretty expensive. But the idea here is that it's, where'd it's you get that number from? Cost a million he's, dollars, according to the article. A million, or I mean, unaffordable. I guess just that that's the main idea here. Okay, okay. but um, gotcha. Uh, dang, this guy's like peer reviewed only. But anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, yeah. So no, he, he actually plans to making as a similar cost that of laser surgery, laser laser eye surgery. I mean, mm-hmm. right? So can you imagine that? Like, it's it'll be that affordable. And to also add to another point with, with the concerns regarding like, oh, what happens if you have to take it out and everything? Like, again, we're a lot more complicated than pigs, for example. But he's able to add the add, sorry add the chips to the pig's brain and mm. remove it, and the entire process there's no neural damage and there's no change in behavior. So like I guess he's trying to prove and and he is he is showing that it is possible without any is, uh, issues. But it's I mean it's more you have to build uh, consumer and also just in general big pe- trust from the people. Yeah, 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 that's fair. If you look at what's going on now in neuro research, like it's mainly based on what MRI scans and brain activity. Yeah. Right. But now we're going directly to the brain and connecting to it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you guys have seen like what he's, what he's done so far, it's 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 crazy. Like they have like it's not even a surgeon. They have a robot, mm-hmm. and what it does is that it literally, it literally cuts open their head, mm-hmm. scans the brain, the brain, whether it be for blood vessels, and just maps the whole thing, and then just starts injecting gold wires. That's so fascinating. Wires in the brain. You know why we always used fMRIs to map the to map the brain because everybody thought no ethical professor or researcher would ever think to put something into some participant's brain, right? To just map it out. It doesn't make sense because ultimately the risk for that is pretty high, right? But then comes Mr. Musk and, you know, he's a very ambitious dude. (laughs) And I just don't understand how that got flipped. Like as soon as I saw him talking about the potential of having this in people's brains, something that researchers basically took a step back from. It's not that this is new technology. This was possible. This was possible for a while now. It's just that this man was like, hey, you know what? I think it's pretty useful for the following reasons, and I have the money to support that theory. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Trust the Musk, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, he's been doing a lot of good work, but I don't know whether this is going to um, end up being something that precedes him because ultimately if the technology is there it could be used for a whole host of reasons right but it is useful for the purposes of mapping because fmri they're they're not great like here's how elon musk basically describes it it's like putting a stethoscope on a factory wall and you hear all these sounds but you don't know what the machines are doing right there are many types of neurons basically millions types of neurons all very very different they belong in different categories that you're being like taught what they are in school but they're all very very different they all belong to different lobes on the brain they all do different things they're all very complicated yeah i mean there's a reason it's called the black box right like you just can't see in it you can hear these moving parts but you you can't see what's going on right here's the thing like 
uh, I know there's like there's like there can be a lot of negative connotations to it, mm-hmm. right? But even looking in past history, like it's oh, there's always a stepping stone. Like yeah. you have a, back during the time of, for example, when Christianity was a uh, like the, the big player when it comes to government governance. Sorry, yeah, right. Like medicine was actually based on what you could just see from the outside. Like you were never allowed to like open a human like body or a cadaver mm-hmm. yeah. because you know it's against their religion, mm-hmm. right? At the time, so like I get it. He's pushing a boundary that a lot of people don't want to cross, right? And even if even if it you know comes out negative, like we're gonna learn from it. Yeah, yeah. Like I do believe in its potential in doing positives, but at the same time, there is a risk of basically having some very very big issues. For example, if if there was some type of update uh, regarding letting you let's say let's say the the technology now lets you see better, right? For people who are who are blind, it's going to let you see better. And then there is this update to make sure that it works better, right? Let's say the update doesn't work the way that people intended to, Mm -hmm. right? Then it becomes a very, very big issue because you could potentially cause some permanent damage to their vision more so than it was before. Because ultimately these wires are connected to parts of the brain that control um, the eyesight, which is the occipital lobe, right? So you don't want issues. Mm -hmm. So is it going to, over the long term, is it going to do more Mm -hmm. good than bad? Well, I mean... to answer, I mean, to answer that question, I think it's important to look at like, like any kind of technology, any change in our lives. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. like every every day has risks, right? Okay. And even if, let's let's just say the chip was to shut down, yeah, right. Like, I don't think it would like cause like major health concerns, especially since again with the new technology with regard, with regards to the surgical robot, it scans so we can avoid blood like blood vessels and arteries, right? But then again, like you can you can use any you can use that argument against anything. For example, with a Tesla, right? Mm-hmm. Like you could buy a Tesla, right, and Look, look at the problems it's had. You know what I mean? It, it autopilot that fails. It, 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 it lights on fire. You could just you could just play it safe. You know what I mean? And get like a classic, you know, Toyota Corolla, something that just like, isn't like technology advanced. He's pushing the boundaries. That's the same thing with driverless technology, right? We push the boundaries. We learn from it, and we can like develop it to a point where we don't even think about it anymore. Yeah, it's it's like a numbers game, right? We're trying to close that gap. We're trying to reduce the amount of actual failures that occur. And as the product enters its life cycle, as it matures, we get better. Mm-hmm. We we start not making as many mistakes, right? No, for sure. And I think it's also important to look at the the pros, right? Like for example, what is Elon trying to do with this technology, right? Like the big the biggest thing would be what. Neuro, uh, curing neurodegenerative diseases, right, right, and from there we can help those in the future. Again, like looking back to you, Fidel, you talked about with the monkey, mm-hmm. right? Like, for example, do you want to like, like how, like just on top of your head, like how do you think that would help somebody with with, with regards to these diseases? Yeah, because you can, for example, um, solve some deficient motor function with an individual, someone who can't move their hands, can't move some type of limb. Right. And potentially if you can set it up using your brain, you can have some sort of bionic arm and from there you can solve their issues. Yeah. Seamless integration. Right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. But then that, that obviously opens another door, right? I have a better arm than my biological arm. I can compete with this arm in, I don't know, the NBA and do mm. so much better than everybody there. Where do you cross the line? So it's a, uh, and forgive me for this, arms race is what you're saying? Exactly. Oh my God. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> you really pulled that out, eh? <laughs> no, no, but like, to be fair though, like with any kind of new technology, like doesn't it require a lot of uh, government intervention? Like again, I'll use an example with regards to cars, right? When they first came out, much faster, much more uncontrollable than horses, right? So government intervention came in and they said like, you know, whether it be like road laws and like, you know, lines on the road. That's after, that's after they make the mistake. Right. Because, for example, in social media right now, we're living in the age of sharing, posting and uh, basically what they call seamless um, communication. There's a lot of positives that you can think of. We understand now after you living with it for so long that there is so much that is bad with it. We can't control it anymore to the point where it's just integrated into our lives. You can't have that type of regulation that you expect from from governments. In fact, if anything, these transnational companies, they're bigger than most governments. They're very big. They have a lot of power and whatever they deem is safe and not safe is what ends up being done anyways. Right. So I don't imagine this is going to work out if 
it's going to really fully reach its potential because what we're talking about here is something that eventually will become uh, become just commonplace all over the world. Everyone is going to have one if it becomes something that not only the sick end up getting, right? Because it ends up enhancing your human experience. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I understand that. And I guess maybe on this podcast, I sound like I'm, I'm like biased towards the positive end, right? <laughs> but, but like, but to be fair, like, like we humans have always liked to push the boundaries, right? Like same thing with space, yep. right? Yeah. And these things work with strict uh, regulation, whether that be through the government or through industry or whatever. Mm -hmm. However, it's like you said, like, we always like wait until it gets bad. But I think we've developed now as, as like a people, especially with technology like this, with risk this large, I think that we would be able to recognize them early on and get ready for them, right? I don't know if you guys agree, but at the end of the day, it's high risk, but high reward. Yeah, yeah. And there are testing procedures too. Like in order to make sure that these problems have a very low chance of occurring, there's probably very realistic lab scenarios that they would have to go through to make that happen. Mm -hmm. It's true, but I've seen... So for that to happen, you need a very directed way of testing it. Yes? Mm -hmm. So if I was That's going fair. to do this then I want to know what the risks involved for doing that specifically is. But if you check out, for example, Neuralink's website, they're deliberately vague with the prospects of this technology. Realistic or not realistic, they are vague, right? I don't know what they're testing exactly. I'm not, I'm not, the, I'm not the gloomer here, trust me. Like I'm, I'm really <laughs> just saying that this will eventually cause problems. It will, right? To what degree? We don't know. How is it going to help a lot of people? Well, it kind of depends on how they end up uh, basically implementing all their stuff. Mm -hmm. And to that point, what is it that you're going to say, no, they can't do that, right? What, what, is it, uh, what are the boundaries to their applications? Is it going to be memory? Is it going to be mm -hmm. um, vision? Is it going to be this? Is it going to be that? Is it going to be physical enhancement? These are all matters that end up opening a whole can of worms regarding ethics and morals mm -hmm. that I don't think any government would ever want to end up discussing um, and deciding for their people because there's no way in you deciding this for the betterment of humanity in its entirety without having possible caveats. For sure. No. And I think the one thing that has going for it is that, which actually tends to be a negative side, but Anything with regards to medicine or health, it went with regards to our uh, like a government is strictly, and I mean strictly regulated, especially with a lot of loopholes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, or is it not loopholes? I meant uh, hoops, but I guess there are loopholes. I won't lie, but uh, <laughs> no, no, for sure. But and it, it makes sense. It makes sense. Like again, like for example, with sports, right? Or like it, how, how does it become standardized when we start having new technology? Right. For in like, I'm just trying to think about it right now. Like, let's say with runners, right? Yeah. Let's say the they all have uh, prosthet new prosthetics for their legs, right? But w at that point, then it's not. It doesn't become uh, like skill or or hard work. Wouldn't it be engineering? Like, who had the better engineer at the end of the day? Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Good I way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many movies, so many so many shows about this as well. We've played, for example, not even played because it's it's a defective game, <laughs> Cyberpunk. In case uh, you guys haven't played Cyberpunk 2077, bless your hearts, uh, it <laughs> is basically a memory that can be recorded and stored for later viewing. And this isn't just like a memory as in like a movie. This is like the senses, the emotions, you know. I believe in the game, uh, they have someone rob a bank and then capture all that raw emotion on footage. And then now, you know, those psychos out there can enjoy the feeling of robbing a bank uh, in all of its glory, so to speak. Yeah, and uh, it's fascinating to see that you can potentially have sensory experiences outside of your immediate body, but then... What if you end up recording a, a very, very traumatic experience that caused that person, for example, to completely blast off, complete, like, or go into shock, right? Yes. That yeah. is very dangerous. You can possibly have viruses in the form of that. Yeah, what if it gets weaponized? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's one of the issues because most people, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer of this, most people do have good intentions. Like 98% of us have good intentions. Those 2%. Within, within our communities, they will also have access to such technologies, right? And whatever it is their nefarious ideologies bring them to do, these are, again, means to implement them, whether that be things as extreme as terrorism or things as simple as like making people believe a lie. I mean, 
Like, again, as you guys talked about it, like, I'm just trying to think of all the good things as well. Like, it's like you said, remember the idea about how somebody who robs a bank can, like, other people can experience it as well. Like, why don't we just do that, but with raw, positive emotions, happiness, right? You know? Like, again, like, I mean, we can probably talk about this later like, into more depth, but like, mm-hmm. even with mental health, right? Yeah. Like, isn't the whole point of taking medications to help you, you know, improve your mood to make mm-hmm. you feel better, right? Now, we're not throwing any chemicals in just hoping to God it works. But we can only just upload emotion and they make you happy. Yeah, right. Yeah, of course, that will help people's mental health definitely. And, and yeah, another thing is we've been talking about the actual memory itself, but what about the absence of memory? Perhaps we could help patients who have experienced traumatic memories in the past uh, cut them out, just remove them or modify them to alleviate the pain that they feel. Maybe we could insert the uh, nice memories that Maud was talking about and help a patient feel a lot better, recover a lot faster. Yeah, and the opposite side of the spectrum as well with people with dementia or people with schizophrenia or people with any sort of neurodegenerative disease that might affect their cognition might be able to utilize this type of technology to help them Mm -hmm. at least feel a sense of normality. Yeah. Yeah. They could make backups. Maybe we could even fill in the blanks. Like we could give them the memories that they, they, they are losing. Yeah. But like, to be fair, when you guys are talking about this, like, like there are kind of, if you think about it, like there's probably like a couple of red flags. Like I'm trying to like if you're, if we're talking about removing emotion, adding emotion, removing memories, modifying memories, like, don't you lose sense of like, what is you? What was artificial? Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would be a little skeptical, I, I suppose. You're adding the hand of God into the equation then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you, I'm not all positive. There's, <laughs> I can see some problems. Yeah, because if it was up to us to choose what evolution was trying to perfect for billions of years, we might screw it up. So mm. these, are, these are dice that we're dealt with. High, as, as you said, mods, like high reward, high risk. And that's what we're playing with. Yeah. Yeah. Some neuroscientists, though, are very skeptical about the future of this. They just believe like it's, you know, how at the beginning of uh, psychology, for example, there is something called pop psych. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And uh, everybody was just into like really, really weird psychological theories that did not have any basis in science. This may be one of them because right now we don't necessarily understand the technology and and its impact. We don't know how the brain works, even though I will soon have a degree in that. (laughs) (laughs) Shameless plug. (laughs) Perfect. Yeah. And uh, the point to make is if we don't know where it's going to go and we don't know what it's going to work on, then you can't guess at what the outcome is. If I don't know the Mm -hmm. inputs, I will never know the outputs, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. so yeah, that's that's uh, some of the some of the skepticism there. I'm hoping that for our sake, we end up knowing things that end up being more useful than it is dangerous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, better safe to be sorry. And you know, it's like lighting a fire, right? Like if you don't know that fire is going to burn, then that's pretty problematic. So maybe you should consider everything that you possibly can within your power before you go and start creating stuff like this. You know, all these, like maybe science fiction and all that is just fiction, but there is some real implications and real world societal effects that might be uh, at play that we have to consider before we take that step. To be honest with you, one of the main interests of mine using this technology is a new way to diagnose patients and provide care. Because right now, diagnosing, for example, any type of uh, psychological, mental issue or uh, or health issue, for that matter, is very, very hard. There is barely any consistency amongst psychologists, psychiatrists, and the like about who, who is truly depressed, who is truly anxious, who is truly... Because they end up overlapping to some degree. And I think this will be very, very useful to helping those people, just targeting different areas within the brain, whether this is, whether certain neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters are basically like this chemical cocktail that gives you the, like the different feelings you you get, right? So uh, finding out which one is deficient, finding out which one is, is working and whether different sites within the brain are associated with different mental health illnesses, it becomes more uh, specific to that patient as well. We could have personalized care. Um, using this technology, we can find out what type of things are working for you. And this, this will have in of itself, this is enough for it to justify having a chip in your brain, because this is a lot of good that can do the world. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not flexing, but like, it's been a long time since I've been to the hospital, but, uh, <laughs> All right. but like the last time I remember, which was a long time ago, um, 
I sat down and the doctor goes, okay, so you're feeling pain, right? I'm like, yeah, it's, I think it was my stomach. And he goes, okay, now look at the, like, look over at the wall. And I look over and it's a scale of one to 10, but with smiley faces on each one. It's emojis, I mean. Yeah. Right. And he's mm-hmm. like, so choose which one best makes you feel with regards to the pain. 11. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> right. And like, there's no standardization whatsoever. Mm. But now, like, as, as you discussed, imagine the, doc- like, the doctor can almost like physically experience your, your actual pain. Right. Like, can you imagine that? Wait, like, wait, wait. Are you saying the doctor will feel your pain? I mean, like, why not? Like, why can't his, oh why, wait, pause, pause, pause. Like, why can't his brain connect my brain and just for a second. And find out. Uh, yeah, just yeah, like, okay. yeah. like it mimic the, like, okay, he wouldn't actually experience it, but he just mimic the pain in, in the body and like diagnose from there, right? That's a very interesting point, actually, because here's the thing. Doctors are very terrible at self-diagnose, uh, self-diagnosing. Do you know that? I did not know that. Really? Yeah, they're absolutely horrific. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. So I wouldn't... <laughs> there's, it's, a, it's a lose-lose situation there. It's like, I will feel your pain, and I still won't know what's wrong <laughs> with you. <laughs> well, the name of the game is accuracy, and right now, as we know, pain is relative. Mm-hmm. But if we are able to experience it, perhaps a scale could be constructed. Like maybe there will be different metrics that we can use yeah. to diagnose pain, right? Mm-hmm. And I mean, also, like we can go even further, right? Because instead of using just for diagnosis, what about treatment, right? Like, let's say we're doing like a a very like again like brain surgery, very very complex and very very fine motor movements, right? I'll, like. Even the best surgeons will tend to struggle sometimes, right? So instead of making let them controlling you with their hand, why not control a surgical robot, a surgical arm, for example, through their through their mind? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I can see that. Like, the, I feel like the like the possibilities are endless. Again, positive and negative, of course. Yeah, yeah. So that would also redefine health, wouldn't it? Because oh. yeah, ultimately, we don't to this point right now as we're speaking, even without this technology. The word healthy is very broad. We don't know what healthy means. Yeah. We, how bad is your condition? Help me out here, guys. How bad? I guess you're asking is like, again, how, what do we define as bad for each individual? But like, again, like, like not bad enough for it to be sick. Yeah. Uh, what we define as disease, the, the threshold. Line. Yeah. Where is the threshold? There's no yeah. threshold. Ultimately, we might even, def- uh, we might even find people with different inflammatory responses that are very, very benign. That being a indicator of someone being sick. For example, there are so many reasons for why people, for example, get rashes, so many reasons for why people get headaches, there's so many reasons for Mm -hmm. why people get migraines. These are all things that might end up being looked at as if it was very much more serious than it is right now, because usually now if you have a migraine, what do you do? You pop an Advil, right? Or Tylenol. But uh, it, it then also becomes, if your technology is a part of you and your technology is defective, are you healthy? Because you become dependent on it. Yeah. Right? Mm, and that's also, a good point. Yeah. And also at your title point, just imagine how weird it would be. If like, oh, okay, I'm having a I'm having a really bad migraine. You pull out your phone, you go to your app, and then you just go like dopamine. You know what I mean? Like something, <laughs> something as crazy as that. That will create so many issues. That's so many oh, issues. Oh, that yeah. might be that. Yeah. I think abuse is the word that I'm thinking of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, for sure. For sure. But then it's also- Isn't again, that what drugs are for? <laughs> <laughs> when they're on your phone, I mean. <laughs> yeah. No, but like it's you, 100% what you're saying is correct. Like I'm even like thinking about, like, imagine comparing it to like your iPhone, for example. Mm-hmm. Like like everyone knows that one person who has to have the newest iPhone every year. Yep. You know what I mean? Sells it, rebuys a new one over and over again. Mm-hmm. Right. But now we're talking about our, our, our bodies. Yeah. Right. So again, like, let's say, for example, again, redefine Buy a new body every year. Oh man, the, the oh body my. would be too far, I think. <laughs> but like, like for example, like in school, right? Like, I guess like this chip enhances your. Uh, let's just say, for example, hypothetically, it enhances your memory and your learning speed. Right. Why have school as old? Wait, pardon? Why have school at all? Oh, uh, I, oh! Now, now you're asking the real questions. You just, you just ruined my hypothetical. <sighs> yeah, that tangent would probably be an entire podcast on its own. Yeah, I know, and we're going to get to it. We'll make an episode out of it. It's a, it's a date. Yes. It is. <laughs> no, but uh, no, but again, going back to let's say, okay, let's say school is useful, right? So <laughs> it wasn't supposed to be a joke. Mind blown. <laughs> I love how it's like, let's say, like it's, it's not even sure. Hypothetical for us. Everything is in your mind. <laughs> yeah. So. Let's say I have the like, the tenth generation of the chip, mm-hmm. but the guy to the next to me has the twelfth one. Okay, right. So he has increased processing speed, increased uh, storage, and everything. Yeah, right. Does that like he is now defined as the healthiest person in the room? Yeah, right. Yeah. 
So I guess like incorporating technology into ourselves also comes with the limitations of technology that it's endlessly and continuously growing and developing to something stronger forms. Yeah. Right. Well, I could see a capitalistic spin on this because people are definitely going to want the newest model. It's really difficult to anticipate what percentage of the population will feel like that because we couldn't predict that with iPhones and whatnot until, uh, you know, the modern age. But I could see that being much more of a priority for people, especially if it comes to health, right? Like wellness is an absolute human end goal, uh, current goal, past goal. You know, people want to feel good. So I'm not feeling good if I have the 1.0 or the 2.0 of this technology because, uh, I don't know, little Jimmy over there, his parents come from a wealthy, I don't know, ancient kingdom. He's got like the 14.0 advanced deluxe edition with uh, dopamine bursts on demand or something, right? Yeah, <laughs> so he's clearly has the upper hand, right? So yeah, it's this is all fascinating stuff. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, w- what are your final thoughts? What do you think is going to be... Uh, like what we're going to try to strive for with this technology, whether you think it's more advantageous than it is disadvantageous. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like you said, it's gonna, there's a lot of problems that can come from it. Yeah. Right. But again, I'm going to take a positive spin on it. And I think that if we truly learn from past mistakes, mm-hmm. regulate it properly, yep. we can say, we can help people who are in wheelchairs or even like completely uh, paralyzed from the neck down, mm. regain yeah. that life that they lost. Yeah. So, and that that's more in the short term too. Yeah. Short term ish. So, so I, in, on my side, I believe in, I'm in favor of it. You're in favor of it. Are you in favor of it, Simon? Man, I'm like playing the the mediator in this situation. <laughs> but I have to say, and it's with any technology, I think the end goal and the product that arrives at the end that is refined after you know a lot of years of testing of what all the uh, experiments and real life actual scenarios occurring. I think that this technology will definitely benefit these people. And I think that's a very, very good goal to strive for. Uh, Above it all, I think these people deserve to regain their life. Like, I think everybody deserves to to live, right? Like, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I I like both of your perspectives because it focuses more on the advantages because I would like to believe that this piece of technology will more so be used for good than it is for bad. And I would like to believe that whatever it is that its potential will be, we'll, we will also exceed that and potentially have it as much more useful than we believe it even is right now. I'm just worried about the fact that we are the only ones in control, right? And we are human. We make mistakes. And mistakes are very, very costly when it comes to these type of things. It's, it's a very, very powerful tool, whether you use it for good or bad. And the potential of it being used for good is enough for it to justify its existence. But we also need to be very careful of the bad. Now that we have basically (laughs) concluded this episode, we also have two more episodes, guys. If you want to hear us out about the cognition and communication uh, aspects of this technology, as well as other implications uh, with similar technology as well, as well as as the security and bionic arms race episode, that is our third episode of the series. Yeah, that will be very interesting. But I believe that social cognition one is going to also be very, very interesting because ultimately what made us better than every other form of human being is our ability to communicate, right? I'm talking about Neanderthals and and Homo erectus and all those guys. So (laughs) yeah, so uh, very, very interesting stuff uh, so far. I think it's been going well. Yeah, Yeah, please tune in. Like we haven't recorded the episode as of now, but I am super excited. Mm-hmm. And feel free also to reach out to us about any ideas for like, topics as well on our social media. <laughs> we want to hear your opinions too. So please, like, yeah. how do you guys feel about it? Like, how do you feel about a chip in your in your head? Like, you know. All right, ciao. <laughs>